Uh, I see that people are joining the webinar. And so while that's happening, I'm just going to introduce myself and introduce this um, panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, my name is Bill Valerio. I'm the director of Woodmere Art Museum, and I'm very excited about the program we're about to present this evening. Um, the program's title is A Game of Charades, Roundtable Discussion on the Art of Larry Day. Woodmere is a museum dedicated to the artists of Philadelphia, and something that we think about all the time and attempt to build into everything that we do is making the art of Philadelphia, whether it's the art of the present or the art of the past, um, bring it into dialogue with the things that people are thinking about today. And one thing that we like to do is create dialogues between artists and especially dialogues between artists over time. The exhibition Body Language, The Art of Larry Day, is on view through January 23rd. So there's a little bit more than a week or, you know, say eight or nine days left to see the show. I hope everybody runs to Woodmere to see it. Um, there's a terrific review in today's uh, or article in today's uh, Philadelphia Inquirer about the show with um, you know, the artist Peter Payone, um, who was a student of Larry's talking about what Larry Day's art um, means to him. And tonight our program um, is working with a group of contemporary artists who were, who are all too young to have been Larry Day's students, um, but who nonetheless um, no, no. Are, are really interested. I was in... a student. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> um, didn't mean to get that wrong. Um, so, um, we're going to hear from three artists who are too young to be Larry Day students and one artist who just made it in under the, you know, under the line um, to, to be a student of Larry's. And um, I'm going to leave it to our um, organizer of tonight, TK Smith, who's my friend and um, uh, partner on previous projects, uh, TK is a curator, writer, and historian, and a student in the PhD program at the University of Delaware, and um, an all-around, you know, wonderful person and um, interesting um, thinker in terms of engaging with the meaning of art. And TK is going to guide us through um, the conversation with our panelists, who will be introduced. Um, I, it, the introductions will happen as the program begins um, in an organic way. Um, I'm going to leave it at that, but just describe some of the housekeeping rules of Zoom. This, this should all be pretty familiar to everybody at this point. Um, we are recording this webinar. We hope everyone is comfortable with that. And um, with regard to questions, here's how the evening will unfold. There will be about 45 to 50 minutes of this conversation. And then um, we will have time for question and answer. And what we would ask you to do is write your questions into either the chat or the Q&A. Um, we had a good laugh in the pre um, the preparatory session saying that no matter if you say, you know, put your questions in the Q&A or put your questions in the chat, they end up in both places. So um, take your pick and, um, you know, TK will be, um, you know, moderating questions together with Hildy Tao, who's Woodmere's Director of Education. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to TK. And I'm looking forward to this discussion. TK, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Bill. It's hilarious because we live on the same street, basically, and that siren just passed by my house. Um, it's, it's just turning on Baltimore Avenue. I can hear <laughs> the magic of Zoom bridging us all together. Um, yeah. But thank you so much, Bill. Thank you, Hildy. Thank you, everybody at the Woodmere and the artists gathered here today to talk about Larry Day. Um, just to give you all a sense of what this program is, I'm going to share my screen, which is 
of course, the most awkward thing to do. But I just want to show you a couple of images that inspired this talk. So one of the most famous images and one of the more iconic images from body language is Poker Game, made in 1970. There are also some accompanying or companion like drawings and sketches. But what is kind of iconic about this image is that it's a, it depicts portraits of artists, a community that Larry knew here in Philadelphia, all gathered together for a poker game that I believe happened monthly. Um, and what we see is an empty chair, which would have been left for Day himself. Um, the title of the program comes from this painting, which is called The Game of Charades, uh, also accompanied by many sketches and a, a photograph that you can find in the catalog of Larry Day himself holding out his hands as such. Uh, the idea is to really think about, you know, I think games were important to Larry Day just as a, as a person, as an individual who enjoyed to play games and be in community in that way. But I think they're also an interesting way to think of how artists rely on the canon and a slew of other cultural influences to create their work and pose their figures and compose their, their canvas surfaces. And so it's interesting to look at his work as a puzzle, as a game, to tease apart how he is communicating to us across time um, and allowing other artists who he is influenced by to communicate with us. Um, if you're not an art history student, it, I'm sure it's a fun game. If you're a student, I'm sure it's stressful. Um, but I'm here now with a, a group of artists that I will ask to introduce themselves and explain why they're in this panel, how they may have been connected to Larry Day or his widow, Ruth Fine, who is joining us now um, from her home across the way in Center City. So I'm gonna start with Sarah. Sarah, if you would please introduce yourself and let us know how you got on this panel. Oh, hi everybody. I'm Sarah McAdini and I'm a Philadelphia based artist. And uh, I moved to Philadelphia in 1973 to attend the Philadelphia College of Art. And I went for two years and I believe Larry taught there during that time. So I am old enough to have been a student, although I never had a class with him. And, but I certainly followed his work and knew his work. And it was only later, and I think probably after Larry died that I met Ruth and got to know Ruth a little bit. And so it's just been interesting to uh, see this show and see so much of his work again after not having seen it for a while and getting to know it so much better and getting to know Ruth too. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna pass it to Joe. Hi. Um, well, I was a student of Larry's and he was probably the single most important um, teacher I had uh, at, at PCA. Um, and I was only, I, I, I never went to graduate school, so it was undergrad and he was the one. Um, and, you know, I, I kept up with him for um, a year or two after uh, I finished there before I moved to New York. Oh, I'm, I'm located in New York. Um, I'm a painter. Um, I want to say recovering art writer. Um, but I'm, I'm not a working critic anymore. I was for a while, but I was always a painter. And I'm still writing, though. I'm actually working on a biography of John Copeland's. So if anybody knows any literary agents, get in touch with me. Um, anyway, um, I knew Ruth a little bit at that time. And then um, actually, uh, when I saw her recently, I was reminded that uh, she, she took over my wife and my apartment uh, in Philadelphia when we moved to New York in 77. So I, I just noticed that uh, Larry retired in 88. So I didn't get in on the cusp of Larry Day. I was in long before he retired and I'm, I'm an old man. Um, anyway, um, is that every answer to the first part? That's perfect. Thank okay. you so much, Joe. Uh, I'm gonna move it over to Mariel. Hi, my name's Mariel Capena. Um, I'm an artist from Philadelphia, though I am currently living in Western Massachusetts in Williamstown, where I'm serving as a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the studio art program. I'm teaching fresco painting here specifically. Um, and, you know, 
it turns out that I'm one or two steps removed from Larry Day in maybe a dozen different directions, but I somehow hadn't known about him until just this past summer and then finally made the connection with Larry through, I, I should say Larry Day, I never actually met the man, so maybe we're not on a first name basis. Um, but uh, I finally made the connection with him uh, this past summer. So I am um, a fresco instructor at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Uh, I've been working there for the past couple of years. Um, and for those of you who may not know, Skowhegan is a school and residency program in central Maine. Um, so this past summer, the campus hosted uh, a panel discussion on the life and work of an artist uh, named David Driscoll. And Ruth Fine, um, the widow of Larry Day, was one of the panelists. And I scooped her up from the airport and spent a fair amount of time with her on campus. And we connected pretty immediately over Philadelphia, um, a shared connection to Philadelphia. And when she showed me the paintings of Larry Day, I just felt immediately so familiar with them. I had never seen them before, but I saw in them my teachers and I saw something of myself in them. This, it, it, uh, his work had a kind of familiarity that I would associate with kind of like seeing an old photograph of a great grandparent or something like this. Um, so yeah, a, a bit of art world serendipity. Thank you so much. And Tyler? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Tyler Goldman. I am an artist, though, an artist of a slightly different stripe. I am uh, a poet and translator for the most part. And I also got an introduction to, excuse me, to, to Larry Day's work through Ruth Fine this past summer at Skowhegan, where I was, uh, I was working with my wife, Marielle, at the Robert Lehman Library, which is the, the small but, but forceful uh, library at Skowhegan, which has about 15,000 or so volumes, which are primarily art and art history stacks. Uh, but there is this wonderful, and when I was first introduced to it, slightly surprising and strange section of the library up the stairs in the corner that was dedicated entirely to poetry. And on the spines of all of these poetry books next to their call number uh, were the, it was the, the language R fine, one word. I had no idea at the time exactly who this R fine was and why there was such a large collection of poetry at this fine arts residency. But I came to learn through Ruth this summer that and really, truly much to my surprise that they weren't actually poems and books of poetry that came from Ruth's collection, but from Larry Days, who was a, a prolific reader of poetry, an early writer of poetry, though it, it does not seem like it was something that he really continued through much of his uh, adult art making life. Um, so my introduction through uh, to the paintings was really strangely through Larry's deep love and appreciation of literature uh, and a really strange host of shared references in, in that world rather than in the painting world. So I come at this from a, a slightly different angle, but hopefully still an interesting one. Absolutely. And I am, as, as Bill had said, a curator, a writer, and a cultural historian. And so I have had the pleasure of being mentored by Ruth. And all of us here are gathered because of something Ruth had said in passing conversation or a compliment she had on a program she saw you in or, you know, Hildy being a lover of your art or Bill being a lover of your art. So I, I'm very appreciative that we are all gathered here to talk about this work. And I know it's strange to say, but I'm not gonna assume that all of you have seen the shows. Now, for those of you at home, you may know that this was a three-part exhibition, um, and this is the last of the three parts um, that is open, and it's only open until the 23rd. 
um, all curated by a London-based curator and art historian, David Beinman, who has a talk coming up, uh, I believe it's next week. Um, and there's also a small show at Gross McLeath, and there's also a future show at Ball State. Um, but for those of you in this conversation, was anybody able to actually see the show? And if you were able to see the show, I'm curious how the show, and Sarah, you spoke on this a little bit, how the show impacted how you remembered Larry's work uh, and how you see it moving forward. Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I saw two of the three parts of the show. I missed the Arcadia show, which I'm sorry to say, but um, I really spent a lot of time with the show at Woodmere. And I would say that it brought back, you know, it brought back the memories of the work that I remember seeing in the 70s and 80s in Philly. Um, but then there was so much more of it and like all the um, preparatory drawings or just related drawings, the very finished drawings. So, um, I wish I had seen the um, the one in Arcadia because that had more of the urban scapes. And then the show at UArts, formerly PCA, was interesting because it was the very early work, which I didn't know at all, the more abstract expressionist work. Yes, all three of the shows were based around different aspects of, of day's practice. And so you have the abstract work, you have the, the figurative work, with, which is usually has the most figures, humans, uh, domestic space. And then you have these beautiful architectural motif, um, urban scapes, which you also make, Sarah. Um, a lot of your work is a, a blend of architectural scapes in Philadelphia and the intimate spaces of, of your home. Yeah, and certainly, um, you know, the show Woodmere, even with all those figurative, there's architectural spaces that those figures are in, like the game of charades, you know, is a good example of that. Absolutely. Did anyone else get to see the show? Sure, I saw them all. <laughs> How'd you feel about them? Um, well, I went around with Ruth um, to all of them. We spent the whole day together. It was great. Um, and you know, I hadn't seen his work in quite a while. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention that the reason I'm on this panel is because I was supposed to be on the other one, but I was up at Yaddo and they wouldn't let me out uh, to, for that panel. So then they asked me to be on this one. So that's why I'm here. Um, anyway, I was, one of the things was I was very, I was surprised at first of all, in the U Art show, that it was really obvious early on that um, he was a naturally talented draftsman. He, it, it was obvious that he just came to that easily. And he could have done anything he wanted, you know. And, uh, you know, I've, I've thought about this work a lot over the last couple of months. And you know, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but um, I happen to be talking to this um, this contemporary curator at the Met on Zoom before Christmas, and he was from Philadelphia. And I said, "Oh, well, you know, you have to see this uh, the show out at Woodmere of this teacher of mine." And I, I just I just blurted it out. I said, "He's the best kind of provincial." And you know, I've had to wonder why I've said that in a way. And the thing I keep coming back to is he's a provincial the way that John Updike and, and uh, uh, um, you know, um, the other guy, uh, John Cheever were great provincials or uh, Richard Diebenkorn was a great provincial in, and they were very much interested in being local as opposed to being, you know, New Yorkers or Los Angeles people or, or whatever, because they sort of drew on um, that kind of quotidian experience, you know, um, and, you know, I, even though I, I knew that Larry had this shot at uh, um, New York when he was younger, and uh, I remember him talking about it, and you know he was crushed by it, but um, 
you know, when I think about him, he was so self-sustaining in his interests that, you know, the work really came out of that, you know, and, and also there's a kind of humor in that work that's very, very subtle because, I mean, I think of the work as being very, very deceptively banal. You know, you look at it and you really don't know what you're supposed to look at right away because there's no trigger. They're, they're not performative. They're like the, the general effect. I'm talking about the paintings in particular um, is kind of like it's atomized, you know, which is very, very modern. You know, as much as he was making these paintings that um, draw on the Renaissance and Dutch painting and they're just, you know, beyond erudite when it comes to the history of, of, of depiction, let's say. Um, you know, they're very Greenbergian in their, their, their breadth and their airiness and their all overness. And uh, well, that's enough for the moment. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious and thank you for sharing that. Before I get to the next question, I'm curious if any of the art, other artists on the panel um, wanna speak to kind of the banal and the mundane and the value of depicting it. Sure. I think uh, um, you can make great art out of anything. And uh, I, you know, I relate to that because I built, my work is narrative and autobiographical. And I've often said from the mundane to the horrific, cover it all. <clears throat> I have a, you know, I have a slightly, a slightly different question to sort of uh, pivoting off of uh, something that Joe said regarding the, the, the sort of provincial nature of, of the work or of, of Larry's attitude toward it I, is a really kind of a, a question mostly for Sarah and, and Marielle actually, which is this, this question kept coming up as Marielle and I were discussing Larry's work, this, this question of the Philadelphia artist or the Philadelphia painter and what exactly that means, because it's, a, it's something that, that does get bandied about not infrequently when discussing Larry's work in the catalog and the conversations that we've had. And, and I'm just sort of wondering if there is some sort of distinct lineage here that's worth, that's worth trying to, to, to poke on a little bit. Yeah, it's funny. I, I was telling, oh, yeah, I'm not muted. Um, I, I was telling Tyler that in graduate school, there were a couple of critics who really just had me pegged as a Philadelphia artist. Like that, that is how they saw the work. And I think I had a similar response when I first looked at Larry's work. Like, oh, that's, that's a Philadelphia artist. Um, and for me, I think what I've been realizing over the past, you know, couple months as I've been really getting to know Larry's work is, is maybe what, what it is, is that there have been a, a really precious handful of really influential Philadelphia teachers. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't I haven't put my finger on what it is. Um, but well that that could be it. I mean, I'm trying to think about it. I, I feel like um, you know, you could go anywhere and you would have a blankety blank artist, you know, you have sure. And um, at this point, you know, although with the pandemic, we're not moving around as much as we used to, but you know, with the internet and everything, we're, we're all kind of aware of everything that's going on everywhere. So it's, but you know, there is something that happens, you know, like what Marielle is um, getting at with the, uh, the teaching, the schools. And we have a lot of art schools in Philadelphia and good schools and a lot of good people teach here and have taught here, but teachers come in from other places and Philadelphian trained artists go other places and everybody shows all over the place. So. But I think maybe the, the teaching aspect might be the key. I would uh, I would double down on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Well, I just wanted to say that I don't want to be, I said banal, I never said mundane. I think they're, they're a little different, but um, I'm not sure about this Philadelphia thing. I'm, I'm talking about provincial more like, um, you know, I've thought a lot about this, this fact that he uses, you know, all these references to Renaissance art and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I thought about how, you know, the reason there was a Renaissance that this classical art started being looked at again is because, you know, originally it was the, 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 the mode of representation for Imperial Rome who, you know, did a number on the Christians when they started. So then we had a thousand years of Christians in Europe and they didn't want to deal with that stuff. So when it came back, you know, it was okay to start bringing in pagan representation and Christianizing it. But what Larry did is he kind of used the paganism in classicism and kind of brought it to the suburbs. You know, so it's kind of the reason I brought Chiefer up is, you know, he would do something like, uh, um, you know, take Ovid's Metamorphoses and bring it to, you know, Ossining, New York or something, the same way that Larry would, you know, take this classical architecture and look at the, uh, the, uh, those um, rowing boat houses out by the Philadelphia Museum or the suburbs or things like that, or even the card game you know, which also has references to, you know, Lenan and, uh, you know, Cezanne and the rest of them, you know. So that's what I mean, a kind of, not a specific provincialism to Philadelphia, but a kind of uh, suburban paganism. I like that phrase. Nice one. Yeah, TK liked it too when I talked to I him about it. Last week. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it because in so many of the figurative works, you can see it feels almost as if you are witnessing or a voyeur into some kind of suburban ritual. Mm. You know, it's, it feels as, as if you are, are witnessing something that happens and has happened for a very long time. And just to kind of pull together some of the thoughts that were articulated, I think that there is something particular about Philadelphia because there are so many art schools here and so many renowned art teachers, but also because Philadelphia is such an interesting city, geographically, historically, where it is, and the various types of architecture that exist here are just beautiful. You know, there is so much to mine from here, uh, especially when you think of the architectural motif paintings. There's, it's just so beautiful. And if you, if you are like me, you know, you believe that the environment shapes the body, and so even when there are no bodies in these paintings, you are seeing the formation of a kind of identity that we could label as Philadelphian or as a day's own identity. You know, it's, it's, it's really rich and, and interesting there. But I want to continue on with speaking about art historical references, specifically of old masters and the idea of being taught something posthumously, being taught something um, from a two-dimensional image, a canvas, a sculpture. Uh, can you speak to how, you know, your own work, possibly, we can start there, is a reference to artists who have, you've been taught by, but also artists who you observe and have watched and have looked at? Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Nobody? <laughs> <laughs> I I uh, I always get nervous about answering questions about my influences and and references because I'm afraid of who I'll leave out. Um, <laughs> but I can name a few. I can get the list started a little bit. Um, you know, I think especially uh, as an artist who's been focusing on fresco over the last handful of years. Um, Piero della Francesca and Giotto and Masaccio are very important to me, um, as well as a number of uh, other mural painters on plaster who have remained anonymous in any number of places. Um, I also feel 
uh, especially indebted to Horace Pippin and Bill Trailer and Clementine Hunter, uh, Florine Stettheimer. Um, I'm just gonna have an ellipsis now. Um, the list does go on. Can I ask, um, sorry to interrupt you, but can I ask what what is it that is catching you about these artists? Is it the aesthetic? Is it is it the what they depict? And is it the composition? Is it the what is it that makes them that makes them keep reappearing? I guess. Ooh. What is it? Um. It's something, I think composition ends up being really important to me. Um, I think when I think about each of the artists that, that I just named, I think what I picture first of all would be the way that um, their respective compositions are characterized either by a kind of density or a scattered something kind of more scattered I think that that ends up being really important to me um the way things you know objects and people in place are either kind of condensed and and grouped or um separated and kind of disparate from one another so I, I think that I think it's probably composition first um In, in the conversation we had previously had, you mentioned that there's something particular about Day's work and the way that he places figures, bodies in relation to each other. Um, just yeah. want to ask if there's anything you want to. Yeah, it's funny. I'm realizing another um, another nice connection right now is that uh, Sarah McEnany uh, curated a show at the Woodmere uh, one of the Woodmere, am I remembering this correctly? The Woodmere annual show um, must have been, I don't know, seven years ago or something like this. And uh, and it included one of my paintings and it's a painting that my mom actually has. It's a big painting that includes, um, a, it's, a, it's a huge painting actually for me. I think something like seven by seven feet. I usually work very small. Um, but in the bottom left-hand corner, there's this uh, um, like a music show, a, a kind of vaguely abstracted, just a cluster of lots and lots of people and activity. And then it's a, it's a very small corner that's just filled with visual noise and color. And then the rest of it is just big and open and sparse and, I think this distinction between um, kind of a, a site or a, some kind of shape of really intense social activity surrounded by a, some kind of a spatial frame. Um, it's something that I noticed in a lot of days, figurative works, um, you know, this group of people that's forming a structure that relates to this kind of, um, whether it's a cityscape or some kind of space behind them or behind that group. Um, and so I noticed that in his compositions um, and it is something that relates to a lot of the artists that I, I kind of just listed off. Um, uh, but then reading through the catalog, which I really recommend if, for all of you in the audience who can get your hands on this catalog, there are some really wonderful pieces of writing in there um, from a number of contributors, uh, and then a lot of beautiful writing from Larry Day himself, uh, from notebooks and essays. But there was a fair amount of writing about um, Larry Day's uh, kind of challenge reconciling the social and the solitary. Um, or the painter as uh, a participant and as an observer. And he was really determined to get to a kind of both and in his painting. So it's not one or the other, but 
but both. Um, and I think, you know, in, in these figurative paintings, especially there are these groups of people gathering, there's this real sense of the social and the, the communal, but there also is a kind of distance, a distancing and some sense of uh, the artist is, um, or the painting practice is a solitary one. Um, the, the, the empty seat at the, at the poker game. Yeah, or the um, when it's Larry painting himself in the studio, or when he painted himself as a boy, you know that yeah. solitary reflection. Well, I think that the distance is certainly in the work, but I think the distance has to do with the fact that he was um, very aware of where he was in art history, and um, there's just a kind of distance that you have, not on e even the Renaissance, but even on Abex, you know, um, there's just, you, you, you're, you're, when you actually, I think, make a work of art, or a lot of people do, they're kind of measuring the distance between uh, the kind of idioms they're involved in and, and their relationship to it, you know. Um, and also on one level, I think that, um, there's something about that work where even though he sometimes depicts things in his life, um, I don't think that he was particularly interested in self-expression or confession. You know, I think that a lot of it was um, very, very playful, intellectual kind of, um, uh, you know, I think I think sometimes I just feel like I'm getting a window in on somebody's private joke. Um, you know. uh, Joe, if I should interrupt you. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, please. I, I was just going to, is it really just like a, a perfect moment very, very briefly to point out, Joe, that his his poetry, this is really remarkably reflected in his his poetry collection. And uh, at least that that bit of it that the 700 or so volumes that that are up at Skowhegan, it is it is it is absolutely littered with poets who similarly uh, have a bit of a resistance toward something like the confessional or self-expression uh, in, in, in that sort of kind of romantic way. There's tons of Auden, Merrill, there's um, the, the, uh, a ton of Ashbery. Uh, and, and so his, his tastes, it seems, in other, in other uh, media were, were, were reflected in his own work. And and I was just going to say we have a question uh, in the Q and A, but I I would love to ask it now. Um, Joe, how do you see humor? You know, what is what is that humor that you're seeing? Well, I think it reveals itself most in the that final set of um, uh, drawings with ink. You know, where they really are. He kind of like lets himself go in a, in a different kind of way in that in, in paintings. But um, put it this way, you know, there is, I thought about that Roland Barthes essay about um, Cy Twombly, where he compares what Twombly does to what kids mark up their desks with and stuff like that. And on one way of looking at Larry's work is kind of like, you know, somebody with their tongue partly out of their mouth and they're, you know, they're drawing and then they're coloring. And, uh, you know, there's a, that, um, there's a very straightforward kind of childishness there on a very sophisticated level, but you never get far away from pencil and paint. Uh, so that doesn't really directly answer your question about the humor. I mean, he was, you know, he was a funny guy that never smiled, uh, <laughs> you know, so, and his, his funniest movie he ever saw was Jacques Tati's Playtime, which was essentially, you know, a silent film and three quarters of the way through it, you see this black couch for the 10th time and suddenly you're rolling on the floor. Um, you know, that was his humor. It, it just kind of creeps in uh, almost subliminally and then 
it's kind of you you kind of get it um you know absolutely and tyler i want to go back to you because and i'm going to bridge this past question with the next question which is how do you see art history and i'm going to to change the language and say translated across canvases and across time across nations even joe we talked about the difference between an American's interpretation of the Renaissance, Dutch um, paintings. I'm, I'm curious, how do you think that knowledge and information, even composition itself translates across nation, across time? Hmm. I, I mean, <clears throat> the thing, this is like a, a slightly oblique way of answering your, your question, TK, but I mean, the thing that, that I, I kind of, can't get my myself away from is this sort of strange situation where uh like like Marielle and, and like like Sarah as well I mean I never got to meet Larry Day uh and yet I, as, as Marielle sort of mentioned earlier I I do have this strange sense of familiarity that that does make me want to call him Larry perhaps inappropriately and this is this is for a number of reasons, one of which is that I, I really do think that you can get to know some aspect of, uh, of, of the person, both through the work, but also through the other work that does seem like it was of great importance to them. I mean, obviously, Larry wears his influences somewhat on his sleeve in the work, often with, it seems to me, some of the humor comes from, I forget who it was that coined the term that he seemed to really like uh, of ironic realism uh, in the paintings. I think, I think Sid Sachs said, talked about was that. Sid, was it Sid yeah. Sachs? Yeah, and th there, there, there is this in being so earnest and upfront with some of these references in the charade game of, of having this figure mirror the architecture, you know, and playing Jesus on the cross. There's, there, is, there is just something incredibly, incredibly dry and wry it's, it's hard not to give a little bit of a stifled chuckle, if not, you know, a, a, a guffaw. But I, I, I think that one of the things that comes across, across the full body of work, not just these figurative paintings, uh, but, the ad, but the more abstracted paintings, some of these, these, these later ink, uh, and ink drawings as well, it, is that this was a person who had, it seems, pretty unlimited range. And that is reflected in his taste. It's certainly reflected in, in these 700 or so volumes of, of literature and poetry that Ruth has so generously donated to Skowhegan. And, and with that breadth comes, sometimes breadth is a depth of its own, I guess I would say. And it, 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 it seems to have allowed Larry to really flex whatever muscles he wanted to flex when he wanted to flex them and to and to allow every bit of uh, whatever it is that really suited him in the moment to to be able to draw on that as an influence be it from poetry uh be it from be it from other paintings very well said tyler <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. i think that that part how i would answer the question about humor is part of the humor comes from also comes from, I should say, where he's pulling sources from. So there are, of course, his old master Renaissance work, but he's pairing it with all of these influences from poetry, literature, um, film, but also like advertisements, like Vogue, um, sure. and also games we all play, like charades, um, material culture that we all interact with, um, which I think, and then also the idea of just gathering for a picnic, for a barbecue, you know, at a table um, or before a canvas even to be posed um, and painted. I think it, some of that humor comes in how we take art historical references so seriously, the canon is taken so seriously. And then you see it reflected in a way where all of the characters are playing charades. That's kind of funny. You know, that's that's it, somebody it, who knows how to manipulate. It, it is, and, and, and you know, maybe tying that as well to the sort of uh, provincialism that, that Joe was starting to get at earlier, one of the anecdotes from the catalog that, that really struck me and, and frankly cracked me up was that his, his 
Larry Day's good friend, the, the, the poet and critic John Hollander uh, mentioned that it seemed sometimes that Larry was sort of playing or doing an impression of a 16th century mannerist named Lorenzo del Giorno instead of Larry Day, which happened to be his actual birth name. Uh, but there is, there is this sort of, there is this sort of uh, bit of, bit of identity play and, and, and charade happening uh, even at that level. Well, I remember the thing that um, we were talking about last week, TK, was the fact that um, when you are using all these um, European models, but you're an American, there's a kind of um, vacancy there, you know, and I, I, I imagine he was conscious of that. Um, you know, this this is um, not a, a not a deep or rich culture. We have, you know, uh, and it's different from uh, from a European painter. So the, there's there's that uh, element in relation to, you know, the models that he's uh, referring to. I always think he's referring to them. I don't think he's he's shoving them at anybody. You know, like he was always endorsed by all of these boring people that tell you about how, oh, Giacometti, Baltus, Duran, Giacometti, Baltus, Duran. There was a lot of them. You know, they were like the other side of uh, the abstractionist or something about the, the return of the figure. And I, you know, it isn't like he was against those people, but I don't think that uh, he was really endorsing that either. I mean, I may be wrong but I don't think he was supporting the figure in that sense. Um, I think his interests were much wider than that. I'm gonna throw in now a question about materiality. Um, also playing off of something you had said before, Joe, about pencil. Um, something you may notice if, for those of you who got to see the show at the Woodmere is that the canvas is part of the materiality. It's part of the compositions of these paintings. Uh, the canvas is sometimes apparent. You know, Ruth Fine has been kind enough to share her subtitle for the show, which is finished enough. Sometimes things are more descript, direct, clear, concise. Sometimes things become more obscure, blurred, um, and seem incomplete. But, you know, she asserts that they, it's finished enough. The point is, is gotten across. Um, I'm curious how materiality works in your own work and how you use it to either obscure or reveal? Well, I just want to chime in and say that Larry Day would have been such a good fresco painter if he had ever tried painting in fresco. <laughs> I mean, really, the way that the, the thinness of paint application, I mean, this is really important for fresco painting. I, there, with with a, a fresco painting, uh, the the paint, which is really just a pigment suspended in water, needs to be applied very thinly with really no body at all. Um, and, you know, with just a few layers, generally the, the white of the wall, the lime plaster will shine through. And when I look at Larry Day's paintings, they, they really look to me like, I mean, I'm, I'm glad they're paintings on canvas, but they really would thrive as fresco paintings. And not only because of that touch um, and the thinness of paint, but also just structurally, you know, a, a fresco is a painting that is, you know, chemically intrinsically attached to the substrate of a, of a wall that's part of an architectural environment. And his, compositions are just so structurally sound. I mean, these are paintings that if they were houses, I would walk into them and think like, this isn't going to fall down. This is a, this is solid. It's everything's really clicked into place. And, you know, ideally a, a fresco really relates to the geometry of an architectural space. So when I think of each of these paintings as its own, complete world that relates in some way to the world around it. I just, I would love to see one of these paintings as a fresco in a like 
in some space in Philadelphia, of course. Um, That's a great comment, Marielle, and I totally agree with you. Having made one fresco at Skowhegan many years ago. Um, it lives now in the Lehman Library. Just yeah, that's right. All um, but uh, it's, it's a difficult medium. And when I look at Larry's paintings, and you know, they're not all, you know, just finished enough, finished enough, like Ruth said, but they, they're very, he knows exactly what he's doing and he just gets it right quickly. And, and they're like, I like what you talk about the construction of them. And uh, they're just like perfectly planned and yet they're not tight. Um, well, I think that um, he had enormous admiration for a lot of these famous artists that made frescoes. But um, I think that the reason he painted that way is because he was very deliberately um, anti-spectacle and anti-bravura of any kind. And, you know, as soon as you start um, manipulating paint, you're um, revealing uh, a lot of idiosyncrasy or, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of triggers of some kind, you know, and I also hate to think that um, they're built that solidly. I think that one of the reasons uh, I still find them interesting and found them so interesting is because I think those paintings are very abstract. And I think that if he kept, if he did finish all those sections that he left blank, then he really would be a figurative painter. But I think that he was very conscious of um, a kind of all overness that was very contemporary, you know, um, so that um, as much as we're looking at, you know, something that was very carefully drafted, I think that a, a lot of a, a lot of what he was doing was, was <coughs> he was completely in dialogue with uh, with a lot of abstraction, a lot of contemporary abstraction. And yeah, he was a, very conscious of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way. I'm a figurative painter, but I'm always thinking about the abstract elements. Could you, you know, say more about that? There's uh, who, me? Uh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's like when you're making a painting, you have to think about the whole thing. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm into the narrative and I'm into objects and people and spaces and all that but it still has to work the composition has to work colors next to each other you know it, it you know turn it upside down and look at it upside down for a while make sure things are working you know, it's like there's abstract elements in any in my opinion in any representational painting well what i was thinking in particular is you look at some of um those portraits of madame cezanne and there's an incredible amount of built up paint in one area and right next to it is is raw canvas. Right. Um, and I think he was thinking that way. Yeah, he talks about in his notes about, he talks a lot about one particular Madame Cezanne. No, uh, no, not Madame Cezanne, Madame Matisse, excuse well, me. Well, that's, that's different. Yeah. But somebody in the chat was asking about Matisse. I guess oh, yeah. we'll go there later. Um, I, I might have to go back for that one, but I do want to, oh, this is really, this is really rich conversation and time is passing faster than always, always faster than expected. But there was a question in the Q and A, um, which isn't really a question, but it leads to my next question. So Bill White um, has said, in speaking about Larry as a teacher, I think his strength to me was his Socratic manner um, he didn't want to tell you how to do it, but to have you find your own way out um, to the choice that would be best for one's work. He asked great questions, and it is the character of his work as well to ask great questions. Um, Ruth, you know, Ruth Fine and I have had conversations where she has stated, you know, you as the viewer have to play a role, a, a significant role in finishing the work in participating in the work and seeing yourself in the work for the work to be complete. It is complete after it is out in the world. Um, I wanna ask you about day as a teacher and or, or just art teachers in general, what makes a good art teacher? What makes a good teacher? 
and what is the impact that that teacher can have on the artistic practice of a, of a, of a training, learning, developing, evolving artist. Well, since you, um, the, the quote you just said, I guess or someone wrote in the chat and what they, I guess they were a student of Larry's. And um, I know when you and I talked about this TK and you asked me this question, I said, um, I felt a good teacher was someone who asked questions, but doesn't tell you what to do. So I guess I was in line with uh, what was just said. <laughs> Joe, could you could you speak a little bit to your your particular relationship to, to Larry as a student? Um, well, you know, um, I've been reading lately about how you know, no matter that that uh, learning is about imitation, and um, I think that probably I imitated him. I probably imitated his mannerisms. I may have imitated the way he put sentences together. Um, I think for a while when I was a student, I was imitating his work. Um, you know, um, I don't think you can, well, I suppose you can help but do that. And, um, you know, uh, then around the time I finished with school, um, I went through um, uh, when you meet the Buddha in the road, kill him phase. And I, I completely rejected, uh, you know, consciously everything that he told me uh, vehemently, sometimes in class. And um, then about a dozen years went by and I was doing this work where um, I thought, gee, you know, this is a little bit like what Larry does. And then I got back in touch with them again. And we saw each other a few times. So, you know, I think, uh, um, uh, it's different for everybody, what you get and, uh, you know, what, how you, who you get things from. Uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I teach and I think I'm terrible. So I don't know what I've gotten from as far as that goes. Truth be known. <laughs> well, to, to add on to that, I would say I, I most recently lost my one of my mentors, one of my great professors, and just reflecting on his life and the impact that he had on me, what I recognize is that regardless of if he was teaching me or chastising me, there was never the, the question that I could not do what I wanted to do. I could not do the work. I, there was nothing I could not do. It was just about getting me to the point where I could do it. And that unwavering belief, that undercurrent belief that I could do whatever I set my mind out to do was life-changing. Absolutely life-changing. Um, so Let me, can I just add one more thing because I don't want to sound too negative. Um, the, the thing that, that Larry gives everybody that I think is very special um, and, and has been, it's just really true across the board, is he's very good at showing you the way the different arts relate. Uh, literature and philosophy and music and art and film. Uh, it's very hard not to spend time with him in class and go through that without being able to make those kinds of comparisons. And it makes your, your whole outlook towards whatever creative endeavors you have very rich and it makes you know, what people make very accessible outside of your particular area. And you said you used to discuss film. In class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I sat around with him and just talked a lot. I mean, that's pretty much what you did with him. And then somebody would want to look at something and he'd tell you what you're up to. Um, well, thank you. Um, oh, sorry. No, that's all. Okay. Well, I want to uh, open up the floor to questions. If any of y'all in the comments, want to hop over to the Q&A section. If you want to drop a question in the comments, I will now be paying attention to those with the assistance of Hildy. Um, and we'll start incorporating those, those questions directly into the conversation. Um, and we do have a question from Bill Valerio. Um, 
Larry worked in photographs much as Aikens did and many other Philadelphia artists have done in constructing their compositions. Do you see an impact in the work itself? Do any of you ever work from photographs? I Not in 25 years, but a, I went through a period of working from photographs. And the thing that I got from it is I got I got really good at measuring tones and I, and I discovered that basically color is about tone. Well, I used to have a rule to not work from photographs. This was a long time ago. And then at one point I decided to throw that rule out the window. And I basically, I mean, I work from observation, I work from drawings, I work from my imagination and I'll work from a photograph. I think of it as like just another kind of note, note taking. You know, and, and just to use whatever's out there to get where I want to go. And I, I think, you know, you know, in Larry's paintings, like when you, you can see where he's um, a, a figure, like one of the ones from the a Vogue magazine or something, and then a figure that he drew possibly from life or from something. And he makes it work together. You know, it's not a problem. I mean, I think Larry looked at a lot of photography for his work. I mean, a lot of those architectural pictures in particular, um, they seem to be influenced by people like Ajay. I work occasionally, if it was somewhat rarely from photographs. And when I do work from photographs, I put them in slideshows that I play rapidly and I don't let myself pause those images. Um, I've found in general that uh, I it, working from moving images is my way of tricking myself into doing something kind of more dynamic or with source material. Um, so I usually work from uh, movies, documentaries, uh, home videos that people upload on YouTube, things like this. Um, but it's it's been really amazing to look through all of the preparatory sketches that Larry Day made from photographs, um, just to, as, as evidence of what someone can do with a series of still images kind of made over and over and over again with small adjustments. Marielle, do you also then work from like moving real life scenarios? I don't, I actually don't. <laughs> um, and, and maybe I should, but I'm always just in my studio. So yeah, no, it's, it's uh, moving images from the past. Yeah. Generally. No. Yeah, I benefit from the flatness of a movie, but I, I need the, the speed as well. Uh, that is one of the, the great things about the show at the Woodmere is that they have so kindly included ephemera from the artist's life, his practice. Um, and then also next to some works, you can see some of the photographs that inspired. Also in this, in this beautiful catalog, you can see a lot of the photographs that directly led to the figure, the positioning, um, all these different composites of different photographs, you know, all of these different people from different places and different spaces. It's very interesting um, thinking about how he selected to put, I'm going to throw a kid in there from this other photograph, or I'm going to, you know, now there's a cat. You know, it's, it's very interesting to see those choices made through that process, even in the, the drawings and the sketches as well. Um, we have another question. Uh, was the spar was sparseness of the environment description, a characteristic of Larry Day's poetry also. What were aspects of his poetry that were directly reflective of his aesthetic? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, before before I, I take a stab at that, I, I do wanna quickly mention, cause I, I saw it here in the chat that it was in fact, Nan Rosenthal, the curator at NGA, the Met that coined that uh, phrase of ironic realism. So I just wanna give credit where credit is due. Uh, so thank you, Nan Rosenthal. Um, so there, there's a bunch of, of Larry's writing in the catalog. There is not any uh, poetry of his in, in the catalog. There's um, 
there's a short story and uh, some some essayistic <laughs> writing and some fragments from his notebook, all of which uh, all of which do, I think, in their in their way, uh, rhyme with the uh, with the spirit of a lot of the, the paintings in in their in their spareness, their deliberateness, their 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 real genuine intellectual rigor. Um, their um, their flirtations with something like manner, but 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 really, uh, uh, they're they're marked by a real uh, a real earnestness through whatever uh, we might want to call uh, maybe so, so a certain certain type of ironic realism. Um, if not an earnestness, then then maybe uh, you can tell that you're engaging with a writer who who is thinking very seriously and very clearly, and. Um, I actually am rather lucky in that I, I, I emailed uh, I emailed Ruth Fine uh, somewhat recently to see if because we had talked about this uh, she had any scans of some notebooks that that Larry had had written some some poetry in uh, earlier in his life in high school and, and it seems a bit after high school as well uh, and these are not publicly available to my knowledge they're not they're not published anywhere else but um but i will say that they do have again all of the it, it's it's clear enough to draw to draw lines between what he was writing the manner in which he was writing it uh and and the manner of his paintings um there is a fair bit and i think in my mind pretty unusual bit of variety for poems that were written uh in such during such a short period of his life and and, and, and such a short time sort of within that period um but they are they are clear-headed they think very clearly they are pretty rigorous in their in their metrics they are they are wry and they are often quite funny a couple of them not in a not in the most obvious, not certainly not in any slapsticky kind of way, um, but uh, they are they are they are smart and they are funny, and uh, I do I do wish that he he had kept writing poems. If if I could add to that, also I have not had the opportunity to read the poetry, but I did read the short story that's included in yes. the catalog, The Lion, and I don't know how he would feel about this uh, me making this connection. But I do think that there's a very, if, if I were to allude to any other writer, it would be, Hemingway would be the most obvious. He doesn't like fat. He doesn't like fat on anything, it seems. It's, it's so clean, so straightforward. So, you know, it's very plain language. And yeah. I do think that, I do think that that translates to the, to the canvas. And I, I, to continue speaking about the catalog, I know that you had, Tyler, something very specific from the catalog that, could you share that with us? Oh, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure to what you're referring. <laughs> no, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, maybe, I mean, I've mentioned a couple of things like sort of in passing through it, but, uh, oh, there was, there was one quote, uh, it was something that he noted in, 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 in the, um, in his notebook, in the fragments, which was a, which was he, he identifies as a quote from from the poet W. H. Auden, which maybe just like can tie us back into this question of the game and 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 art making as game. The, the quote from Auden is that uh, he, he writes Auden's definition of aesthetics as the rules of the game and as art as the most difficult game. And uh, there there is something to that uh, I think, and it, it does seem that the people that Larry was, Larry Day was influenced by and um, the, the writing of theirs and the thought of theirs that he was influenced by that it does seem to have made its way into this, into this question of, uh, of, of art as a sort of game, as a sort of, as a sort of uh, set of rules and forms that we can engage with, uh, with great imagination and, and cleverness and, um, uh, intimacy and distance. So I, I thought that that was that was a sort of interesting little tidbit worth bringing. Up. Thank you. Sure. Now I'm going to ask a question you all probably don't want to answer, which is, how do games play a role in your practice? Uh, I mean, maybe just very very 
quickly and briefly. I know we're we're running running uh, toward the end of our time here, but I I, I will just say that I, I remain convinced that uh, however much we we might want to think of art as as this very um, serious business, it certainly can be, uh, and g- games can be serious business as well. And, and the, uh, but that art is is and always is a sort of game. Uh, in that games are again forms. They are they are ways of uh, ways of engaging with the world, and um, it, it's 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 important not to not to lose track of of uh, of that in a general sense. Not just in the element of play or playfulness, but in in engaging creatively and um, and 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 seriously with 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 different forms. Puzzling things out, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll give you the same evasive answer I gave to TK last week, um, (laughs) which was um, that when I reacquainted myself with Larry, you know, 13, 14 years after being a student, I was very happy to discover that we were both huge Stephen Sondheim fans um, who happens to love games. Uh, or did before he died, um, and um, you know it's it, it's a very it was Stephen Sondheim's a really interesting person to bring up in relation to Larry because um, he's basically an artist that worked with the Broadway musical as opposed to somebody that sort of just came out of that even though he did come out of that world. He's a he's a very odd character that way, where he's 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 in a genre but not of it in a sense, you know. And um, you could probably say that about Larry in general, that you know um, he was playing with genres but not of them. Um, I'll answer your question, TK. Um, so I give myself a lot of rules. Um, and restrictions, limitations, because I have found that it is actually the only way I can get myself to play um, or to make a painting. Um, So for me, my rules tend to involve um, time constraints. So I give myself very specific time constraints. Um, You know, for example, I will tell myself, uh, I'm going to watch this movie and my painting needs to be finished by the time the movie ends. So I've given myself two and a half hours and the whole thing needs to happen in this amount of time. Or I will painstakingly make a very specific uh, palette and um remember where all of the paint is on that palette and then turn all the lights off in my studio and work from muscle memory of where I think I know all of the paint piles are. Um, So I guess my paintings always end up feeling somewhat like races because of the time constraint. And then also um, they're very much memory games, uh, you know, trying to remember something that I saw a moment ago or trying to remember where the paint is on my palette or things like this. Actually, I have one more answer, which is that I think that actually making art for me is, is basically trying to figure out what kind of game I'm playing. Mm. Yeah, it can, it, 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 can, it can be hard to know. <laughs> what about you, Sarah, anything? Oh, well, you know, I said that thing about uh, following up on what Tyler said. Um, and I, when, when I first heard this question from you when we talked, I, I was like, I thought, I have no answer. But through this conversation, that's where I came up with this puzzling things out and figuring things out. Sure. And, you know how it is like a game. Um, even when you're not right, even when you're not giving yourself some of these some of these more you know rule bound limitations that Marielle might be, it, we're simply working with any medium is 
right. is, is, is a game under understanding how a thing is working, understanding, you know, the difference between making a, uh, a painting on panel versus canvas. That's a different, it's a different game you're playing. It's a different, it's a different situation to the, that you've entered into that you need to figure right. out. And you can sometimes give yourself limitations or rules like Marielle, right. or you can like break rules. That's another way to play the game, you know, right. Right. take the board, That's throw it in the air. <laughs> I think for myself as a writer, um, I like to play games with my readers, asking them to seeing who knows the references I'm making. And this is kind of how I, I think I personally connect today's work is that we're making references to things that possibly no one has read in 15, 50, 100, hundreds of years, just to see if anyone can connect to that. Um, and in thinking of, of how knowledge is shared or how knowledge continues or how knowledge evolves, it's even if you don't know the reference, the, the reference has been made, it's been read, it's been signaled, it's been signified, it's been passed. And so that's a kind of game for me where I'll have someone read my writing and I'll think, did you get it? Did you get something from that? Or did you, you know, what does that remind you of? Or maybe they'll come to me and they'll say, have you read this? And I'll say, yes. I have listened to that album and that becomes, that's just entertaining for me <laughs> sure. to, to, to have that kind of interaction with a reader um, and to communicate kind of across media in that way. Uh, we have a, a few minutes left and I did want to say that Bill White, the man who asked that question was a student at PCA from 1963 to 1967. Um, just acknowledging that his connection uh, and the last question I ask is also a very open and, and, and wide question, which is, this is a three-part exhibition, a retrospective that, you know, breaks down a, a decade-long career as an artist, as a teacher, um, into the, the more legible forms, the abstraction, the figurative, the architectural motifs. Um, they produce this beautiful catalog that includes his writings. It includes a, a memory portrait from his, his widow. It includes beautiful essays written about his practice as artists and writers, um, or writers that are artists, artists that are writers. Um, what is the significance of something like this? What is the significance of a retrospective or having a catalog like this? And what would it mean for you as a, as a working artist, as, a, as an artist whose career is continuing now um, to, to have your work and scholarship done around your work in this way? What comes to mind right away for me is the fact that Larry Day was so interested in the relationship between the, the parts and the whole. Um, and uh, the, the parts were in service of the whole and the whole needed the parts. And so often when we see an exhibition of an artist, we're seeing a part, we're seeing a moment in time. And what a retrospective can do uh, is show you something that's getting a lot closer to the whole, to how this artist was actually working through time um, how they were changing, how one work or body of work either led to another or connected to another. Um, so I think this retrospective is giving us all a, an opportunity to really see something like the, the whole of Larry Day's career. I mean, maybe I'm saying something that's uh, just obvious. That's what a retrospective is, but, um, uh, so I don't know, we're, we're able to see this whole and then learn, learn from that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a shame that, uh, it didn't happen in his lifetime, but it's happening now. And that means future generations, younger people can see the work, learn from it. Um, you know, I've had some catalogs done of my work. You know, there's another one that's coming out soon and I, I don't find them very satisfying. 
um, tell you the truth. I mean, I like, it's, it's exciting to have one. And at the same time, um, it's, not, it's not really the way I like my work to be seen. Even in reproduction, I think, I think it loses an awful lot. Um, retrospectives in general, I always try and go to because it changes my mind about the artist sometimes one way or the other. Um, I've gone in both directions after retrospectives. As far as this retrospective goes, um, I see his influence on me in ways that um, I didn't see before and in a good way. So personally, it's been interesting. Um, I think that his work is challenging and deceptive and modest um, and generous. Um, and the one other thing from an earlier conversation I just wanted to bring up is that I think he was very conscious of proportion, which is probably something he got from, um, you know, being that he was so erudite from, I think it's the one Thing he may have gotten from from Asian art, um, and also I remembered that's how he explained Mondrian to me when I didn't understand it. He said, "Well, the the proportions are, you know, are just astounding." And I wanted to answer somebody's statement in the chat about how you said he wasn't a show off, but how come he was showing off all that art history? Um, I don't. Oh God, I forgot my answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if I think of it, I'll come back on. I definitely think he was, if he was showing off, he wasn't loud about it. You know, there are some works that are titled after this artist, after this artist, um, very direct visual references or compositional references, but they're not loud. They're not, they're not screaming, go read a book. You know, I think that they they can be very subtle. Um, too, oh, I, and even I, when they're not subtle, I, I, they're, too, they're they're too playful. For, they're, they 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 strike me as too playful to be actually. To be read as, as... It's it's the thing about him that's actually kind of revealing is because he was he he basically he was a greatness freak. You'd sit around with him and he'd say, you know, this is the best Dutch painting of the 17th century. <laughs> You know, I mean, he, he would do that about all kinds of things. You know, I, we, were, we were talking about the movie, The Four Musketeers, and he'd say, oh, I think that's one of the great films of our time. I mean, that's just the way he talked about things. So naturally, the work was going to come across that way. It would be a kind of, you know, uh, he was a greatness freak. So like he put all the, the, the great moments of painting in his paintings. <laughs> and arguably created some of his own. Yeah. Well, I'm out of questions, y'all. If, if if no one else has any questions, I'm I'm looking at the chat again. Um, right. There was a question about seeing Matisse in the work that from way back. If anyone has any comments on that, yeah, I remember saying to Larry when I was a student, I said, you know, I guess Matisse is the man, huh? He said, yeah. And, you know, uh, I mean, to my mind, um, you know, I personally, I still don't think uh, an artist has come along that has surpassed him uh, in, in contemporarily, you know, like maybe there will be one. Uh, but um, for me, you know, I don't put it this way. I don't know of a figure that's come along that's larger than Matisse in painting. And um, I think one of the re reasons that Larry responded to him, one of the reasons is that uh, he's intellectually astounding, uh, I think. And, you know, I think that you can't leave, we, we haven't used that word the whole time here, but, you know, the thing about Larry is that he had a very intellectual relationship to art, um, which is another thing that one can learn from him. Uh, there are a lot of ways of looking at art, but um, intellectually is one that uh, it comes up sometimes, but doesn't always come up in art school. 
do have another question from Pamela. Do we want to talk about color in his work? The orange and poker game is so intense. She comments. I'm sorry. I, I I have to go, and I hate leaving. You know this conversation, but. I'm no, already. thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, thank you, Sarah. fellow panelists, Woodmere. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Good to see you. Um, well, I'll start by saying one of the things, so Ruth Pine and I had a conversation in the galleries the other day, um, really speaking about legacy, the power of archive um, and the work, the labor that goes into in solidifying an artist's archive, solidifying their materials, gifting their works. Um, and I guess also to answer the question about a retrospective, she says there's this, this salmon pink color that you just keep seeing over and over, especially in the architectural paintings. You just see it over and over. And that's one of the, the major benefits as Muriel said, of a retrospective is that you start to see that artists have been asking questions, sometimes the exact same question or working with the exact same material for decades, for years, over and over again, playing the same games, if we want to put it in that language. Um, and I think color is, is definitely one of the characters in his games. Well, I can give you one color answer, which is, I, 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 it's amazing the recall I have but um, I remember one time I was working on a painting and I was painting some yellow on there and he's behind me and he goes, ah, the seductress. <laughs> and uh, I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know, um, I've noticed when I've looked at paintings that usually if they fail, it's because of yellow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That'll make you scared of yellow for the next 20 years. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, something I've I noticed about is use of color, and I would have loved to see. I don't know if if there are pictures out there of his palette and how he set it up and what tubes he used, but um, there's it, it's a it's a really earthy palette to my eye. Um, a lot of ochres and sienna. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, not to just continue to play my part of being obsessed with fresco painting, but it does, it looks like a fresco palette to me. Um, and then there are these moments of really intense color here. I don't have any pictures up in front of me. I wish I had one to reference, but but there are often these, these moments of, of relatively more intense color often, um, like a warmer something in the red or orange range that really, it, it just really does something structurally, but in, the, in, in very small moments, like a little stripe or something like this, um, that seems to kind of, um, I don't know, hold the whole picture together. Well, y'all, I think we've reached 8.30. Any final words? Uh, well, I, I, it's, been a, it's, been a real, it's been a real treat to, to, get to, to get to engage with this work. And, and I, will, I will bookend this by, uh, in two ways. One, by, by uh, repeating Marielle's instruction from earlier to, to really, if you can get to see these shows, see these shows and, and really get that catalog. Cause it is, it is a, uh, it's a it's a it's a quite remarkable catalog, and um, we have each you know read it and reread it over the last few months, and it has been really remarkably instructive, uh, and 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 quite beautiful. So so there's that, and I also will just mention before we we go that I hope that that Larry Day would be pleased that that once this panel has concluded, I am off to my weekly poker game. <laughs> <laughs> it's true um no but thank you so much um i mean thanks so much 
TK for organizing this and um, and to the Woodmere, uh, Hildy, Bill, Ruth. Um, Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, it's been a really wonderful opportunity to spend quality time with Larry Day. It was a big Absolutely. surprise that this happened. And um, I don't know, in the end, I really touched. Well, everyone, I want to thank you for joining us all um, and echo thanks to the Woodmere, to Hildy, to Bill, um, to Ruth Fine, to everyone at the Woodmere, everyone at all of the institutions that made these exhibitions possible. Um, next week, I believe there is a conversation with David Feynman. He's going to be the curator of the exhibitions. Again, there is another small exhibition at Gross McLeaf in Philadelphia. And this iteration, the Woodmere's iteration of the show is, is going to Ball State next month. So there's still plenty of time to spend time with the work. Uh, and please be safe. It's still a pandemic and take good care. Thanks so much, TK. Thank you, TK. Great. Good night, y'all. Nice to meet you all. Everyone. Nice to meet you too, Joe. Thank you. Bye. Take care.